The wonderful thing about these passages is that any one of them could be their own sermon. So on a week like this, I have lots and lots of material to draw from. I just spent a wonderful week in Philadelphia. Anybody ever been there? City of Brotherly Love, did you like it? Yes, no. No, yes, no. Well, if you're in Philadelphia and it's summer and 95 degrees and 90% humidity, you're not going to like Philadelphia. I happen to be there in uh, really good weather, fairly low humidity, temperatures in the 70s and 80s, and uh, it just felt like God was smiling. It was just that, that kind of thing. Went to a nonprofit leadership course, and uh, I just want to share this because it's such a human experience. I think we've, we've all made these kinds of mistakes. Ever look at a map and think, oh, that's not very far away? <laughs> Have you ever done that? Sure. Yeah. You look at the map, well, that's not very far away. Uh, I did that. I looked at the map of where I was going to be and where I, where I was landing in the airport. Oh, that's not too far away said to myself. Have you ever extrapolated and made assumptions about a foreign place or another place based on your hometown experience? All right. So, uh, for example, if you bank here with, uh, pick a bank, Chase Bank, you may assume that there's a Chase Bank wherever you're going to go, yes? Yeah, I, it, it, of course. It's a national bank. It's going to be wherever you go. So you extrapolate, you make these assumptions. In Los Angeles, what happens, well, you live up here, what happens at 6 o'clock in the morning if you're headed down the 405? I'm listening. It stopped. It's gridlock already at 6. What happens at 5? 5 in the morning driving to Los Angeles. Huh? You can whiz through. It's open at 5, clogged at 6. We all know this, right? If you want to leave, you have to leave incredibly early. Traffic is bad in the morning going into Los Angeles and bad in the evening coming out of Los Angeles. What does the 14 North look like at 5.30 p.m.? 6 p.m.? 6.30 p.m.? When does it start to not be a parking lot? Seven or eight? Well, I was in Philadelphia and I thought, okay, here's what I'll do, this is brilliant. I'll stay in the city because there will be no traffic going out of the city in the morning, everybody will be coming in, and I will have no traffic coming back into the city because everybody will be going out, and it's not that far. On Tuesday morning, it took me two hours and 15 minutes to drive to my... I think it was 53 miles or 48, something like that. It was not very far. So I, I told my wife, I said, I basically rented a hotel room in Santa Monica and I have my seminar in Temecula. It's <laughs> really good setup here. Uh, so how I managed that, I don't know, but uh, a busy week, a full week, a week of learning and, and a lot of fun. By the way, I'm Greg. I just wanted to get that out of the way. Not everybody's going to know who I am, so I'm, I'm glad I can share that with you. I'm going to take this off so it doesn't rustle and uh, make noises, and I'm going to put it right here so you can see in case you forget. And I appreciate you wearing a name tag today. I find that every day that goes by, remembering names is just a little bit more difficult. Anybody in that boat? Oh, thank goodness. It's not an organic thing unique to me. I'm glad to hear that aging is uh, a universal process in some ways. So because we are all every day renewed and uh, every day uh, moving one step closer to uh, eternity, uh, it is good that we have name tags so that we can, we can truly and easily recall and refresh ourselves in knowing one another. Take a minute and thank the person next to you for wearing a name tag. And say their first name. Say hello to them. Oh. 
All right, such enthusiasm. I appreciate that. Anybody know what this weekend is in the Christian calendar? I'm glad to hear it, Eric. Let's uh, see if anybody else knows. In the... How many of you knew Eric would know? All right. <laughs> How many of you think maybe it would be worth knowing yourself? The question is, is it Ascension? Eric, tell us what this weekend is. Pentecost. It's Pentecost. Ascension was, I don't know, a week ago Wednesday or Thursday, something like that. And then we had the seventh Sunday of Easter, seventh Saturday of Easter, and now we're in Pentecost. So we have red here on our podium just to symbolize the Holy Spirit. I decided to wear a Christmas tie. That's what you thought it was, but no, it's Pentecost. It's the fires of Pentecost. But I'm not doing a Pentecost sermon today. I'm not going to do that. We hear a lot about the coming of the Holy Spirit. We know very well Acts chapter 2 and 3. We, we know the stories, uh, and one, actually one. We know the story of uh, the, the disciples gathered in the upper room praying and the tongues of fire appearing and uh, them preaching and being accused of being drunk and Peter giving his famous speech and thousands joining the church and we scratch our heads and we say, I wonder why that doesn't happen anymore. that about it? Don't look at me like that. Was that a fair summary? Great. So we know that story. Why doesn't that happen anymore? The truth is it actually does. Maybe not in that exact same way, but there are still places where thousands come to Jesus every day. And we're going to look at uh, some texts that may help us with this just a little bit. Because it's one thing to say, I'm going to I'm going to focus on the crucifixion. I've sinned. I need forgiveness. I need to be cleansed of that. Jesus' blood takes away my sins. It's one thing to live a little while in the shadow of the crucifixion. That, that we sort of know how to do. We have a long way to go in growing in our understanding of what it means to meditate on the gift of Christ as he died on the cross. That, that we have some work to do on. We know very little and yet we know a great deal, too, about entering his rest. We're Sabbath keepers. We know what it is to enter the rest of the one who has created everything and to enter the rest of one who has redeemed us, freed us, delivered us. We know a little bit about what it means to enter that rest, especially as Seventh-day Adventists. Christ has done a work and we enter it and we rest in it and we praise him for it. It's a work now we no longer have to do or think we can do for ourselves and it frees us. It frees us to so many other great things he's called us to. We know a little bit about resurrection. We've experienced hopefully some kind of conversion, whether we experience that gradually in our lives we were raised in the church. We never knew anything else. But one day we realized that somehow God had taken hold in our lives in a way that didn't belong to mom and dad or didn't belong to the Bible teacher at the academy or the youth pastor or whoever. It belonged to us. Somewhere along the way, those of us who grew up in this realized that we had a faith that was our own. It had become internal. I hope that's your story if you were raised in the church. If not... We can talk about ways to help that become the reality. God grows his people from within and from without. Some of you studied your way into this church. You were converts. You were searching, and God directed you and led you, and you became convicted of a certain set of ideas or truths, and this became your new home. And you know what resurrection feels like because you were dead in your sin or dead in your life before, and now you've experienced this conversion, this new life in Jesus Christ. Something's gotten a hold of you in your life, and you know a little bit about resurrection. But we don't know a lot about ascension, and we don't know a lot about glory. And we don't know a lot about what it means to live in the era of his glory. 
The world still feels like a dark place at times, doesn't it? So these passages are going to give us some hints. And I just want to take us through each of them and see if we can gain something as a, as a congregation, as individuals, that will help us on our spiritual journey post-resurrection and in a time of the Holy Spirit. You see, I believe the Holy Spirit is with us here and now. I believe the Holy Spirit has functioned in your life every moment that you've, you've been awake or asleep except for those times when you've just explicitly told the Holy Spirit to never mind. I believe the Holy Spirit influences you, speaks to you, guides you, and I believe that you, like me and most other human beings, ignore that the vast majority of the time or are oblivious to it much of the time. This is where we develop some spiritual sensibilities and sensitivities. This is where we come alive to Christ and we recognize his voice in the Comforter. I will send one to you. We hear him. We know the voice of the Comforter because we've come to know the voice of Jesus who sent the Comforter. And we've come to know the voice of the Father because Jesus is the one sent of the Father, yes? Jesus said something very interesting, didn't he? He said, if you have seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father. So if Jesus is a full revelation of the Father, he is in the Father and the Father is in him, what kind of relationship do you think Christ has to spirit? Would you say it would be a similar type of relationship? Did not Jesus read the Holy Spirit is upon me to preach to you? Did he not read that? And did he not say this was fulfilled in your hearing? So Jesus was filled with Holy Spirit power too. He was in the Spirit and the Spirit was in him. He was in the Father and the Father was in him. I don't understand it. How do I speak to something without understanding? It's this mystery we never quite penetrate, but it's this experience that we have. Because Jesus invites us to have the same type of experience with one another and with him, John 17. Now, this is a theological treatise, the way this is written, and it's quite marvelous. But let's just take a few minutes. Jesus looks toward heaven as we pray, as he prayed. I just want to make a note on that because we tend to fall into childhood mode, don't we? Can I just take an aside here for a second to kind of help us think, open our thinking to what it is that we hear? How many of you hear sentences and then race right past them because you've just missed a word or your mind wandered for a second? You're reading and you got it, but you didn't get it. It's, what's significant about that? You'll never know. You've gone on to the next thing already. I do that all the time. You do that too? All right, so maybe there's somebody in the world with ADD besides, you know, I don't know, me. He looked toward heaven and prayed. There's an attitude of prayer there that's very interesting, isn't it? What do we teach our children to do? Fold their hands and bow their heads and close their eyes. That's the attitude of prayer. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No. But we get caught and we get stuck in that, forgetting that Jesus prayed in different ways and the early Christians prayed in different ways with different attitudes. I have had people in my churches come to me and say, Pastor, we should never stand for prayer. Really? Why is that? We should be on our knees. We're, we should be humble. I agree we should be humble but you can't be humble standing. There is an attitude of heart that's important more and an attitude of mind more than an attitude of body. Our body can reflect what's happening in our minds and hearts, but is this any less oriented toward God than this? No, just a different attitude of body. What is 
So Jesus raises his eyes toward heaven. He speaks as, as though he's speaking directly into the eye of the Father. It's, it's alive. It's intimate. He's making a choice of prayer, a choice of communication. And we can learn from that. As adults, as people who've grown up, we can learn from the way Jesus prays. We don't always have to pray the same way. Father, the hour has come. Didn't we just talk a little while ago about a miracle at Cana in which he said, my hour has not yet come? He uses this phrase a lot, doesn't he? Christ uses this phrase when he contemplates the beginning of his ministry, when he contemplates when he should go up to Jerusalem to be delivered unto men who will put him to death. He contemplates it for the very time he should die. And now he contemplates it in this prayer. The hour has come, and he's very close to the crucifixion, by the way, so it has dual meaning. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. What was he about to, to, I just said it, what was about to happen to him? Crucified. Now, if we look at that, he was to be lifted up, was he not? All right, what does glorify mean? To, to lift up. But when you're lifted up on a cross, that doesn't feel like glory, does it? That doesn't look like glory. There's a double meaning here. Jesus is saying, Father, the time has come for me to, to make this sacrifice, for me to die. The time has also come for me to be glorified. Time has come for me to be lifted up. The irony is that he's going to be lifted up in an act of sacrifice for his people. He's going to be lifted up. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you, for you've granted him authority over all people that he might give life to all those you've given him. And he says this in a moment when he faces death. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. And it's interesting how in the middle of this prayer, there's John's editorial. For Jesus isn't going to pray about himself in the first person this way. And Christ, whom you've sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. We've come full circle. I've done the mission, and now it's time for the reset. I've revealed to those, revealed you to those whom you gave me in the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they've obeyed your word. And now they know your voice. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They now know. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me, and I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. All, now he shifts gears. Listen to this. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. What does that sound like in California? Common law, community property statute of marriage, yes? Get married in California, and what you have is now hers, gentlemen. Get married in California, ladies, and if you happen to have more wealth than your husband, all he has, all you have becomes his. Jesus prays it this way. The riches of heaven are mine, and the glories of earth, all those you've given me that have been saved, are yours. I will remain in the world no longer, but they will still be in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me. Ah, here it is again. So that they may be one as what? As we are one. Did I read that right? How do we live in light of the glory? How do we live in light of the resurrection? How do we live in light of the ascension and the spirit? We live as one. Wow. 
That's heavy. It means I belong to you and you belong to me. That means when we say you're my brother or you're my sister in Christ, we really are. That has to mean something. When Jesus says, I want them to be one as you and I are one, it becomes a relationship of self-sacrificing love. We give of ourselves to help and serve one another. Some of you have grasped that concept so beautifully. Your lives of dedication and service reflect the love that you have for those around you, and the care that you, you, you have. It's so inspiring to see your lives and to see the ways you have chosen to make them about giving, the ways you have chosen to serve, the ways you've chosen to lift up those who are oppressed, to teach our children, to love our elderly, the way in which you've reached out to the community in friendship and grace. The dollars that you part with on a weekly basis to make the house of the Lord fit and strong. It's amazing. How are we to be one as God the Father and God the Son are one? John says it. The world will know that we're the children of God by our love. I want all of you to say that. The world will know that we're the children of God by our love. That's a powerful thing. By our self-sacrificing love. So that's our text in John when we think about living in light of the resurrection, when we think about living in light of the ascension, and when we think about the glory that comes to us in all of that and the promise of the Spirit. Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in our psalm today, but I want the imagery of the psalm to become clear to you. If you have your Bible, Psalm 68, 1 to 10, the Pew Bible reference was page 534. In verses 1 and 2 in Psalm 68, God is portrayed as a God of might and power. One who overcomes his enemies and scatters his foes effortlessly, as if they were wax being melted or smoke being blown away. The imagery shifts in verse 3, and the righteous are to be glad and rejoice, to be happy and joyful in the presence of God. They're to sing, sing in praise of his name, speak well or extol him. Ah, and there's that phrase, who rides on the clouds, who's above us, beyond us, whose capabilities are beyond our knowing. Rejoice before him, for his name is Lord. He's a father to the fatherless, defender of widows. Does that inform us at all about how we might want to live in light of his glory? He's being praised in the psalm because of the way he takes care of the helpless. So if Christ is glorified in the moment, being lifted up in the moment of crucifixion, and that means two things, both that he's going to suffer and die, a horrible, cruel, inhumane, ghastly, capital punishment kind of death, and that in that moment of dying, there's a glory that comes to him that supersedes and surpasses any in the universe. If it's that dual sort of thing, then how does that inform us about living? We go to the psalm. This God that Christ is one with, I am in the Father and the Father is in me, is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. He sets the lonely in families. That's a weird sentence, isn't it? Did you catch it? I looked at that and said, what on earth is that talking about? 
We were reading in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1, the story of Hannah. Second wife, or first wife, but not fertile. Panina, her rival, her second, the second wife of Elkanah, has children. She does not. Well, you know the story. She goes to the temple. She prays. Eli thinks she's drunk. Eli ends up blessing her, declaring peace on her and sending her away with the blessing that says, may God do what he has, what you have asked him to do. And she bears a male child named Samuel who becomes a mighty prophet and priest in the house of the Lord. A firstborn who, like John the Baptist and like uh, Samson and others will take the Nazarene vow, not cutting his hair, not drinking strong drink, will be raised in a very simple, straightforward way, and will be wholly dedicated to the Lord. That story is an illustration of what the psalmist is saying here. God sets the lonely in families. Hannah was lonely, believe it or not but God set her life in order. He leads out the prisoners with singing. And then this footnote, but of course the rebellious live in the desert. When you, God, went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook. The heavens poured rain. You gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed the weary inheritance. Your people settled in it, and from your bounty you provided for the poor. God, in desolate places, creates value, beauty, oasis, provision for his people, rich and poor. And we participate in that. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you've been to Israel, you know the ways in which they have taken a desert and made it a forest. You know the ways in which they've taken arid land and made it fertile. You know the ways that they have brought vineyards and grapes and wealth and abundance out of nothing but stone. And how cities have risen in the valleys of scattered stone. You see, when we believe what God has promised, when we believe what he foretells, incredible things happen. Incredible things. Another hint, maybe, not only at how God's people have lived in the past, but how they might live in the future. Sing to God, you kingdoms of earth. Sing praise to him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens, and do thunders with a mighty voice. This is the Jehovah. I like the images here because actually the names of God in these places indicate almost regional gods. We're not talking about pantheism per se, I mean a, a pantheon of gods per se. But Jehovah is the thunder god, the god who rides on the clouds, who crosses the heavens and thunders with his mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, his majesty is over Israel. You are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. It's praise, it's a song, it's a hymn, it's imagery. But Christ, who stands at the right hand of the Father, who's promised this comforter, is the same one. And the expectation hasn't changed. Jesus said in Matthew 24, when I separate the sheep from the goats, here's the criteria. You took care of the disadvantaged among you and the displaced and the forgotten. You loved all that I had given you who were in the world. There's that word love again. You know, if love were easy, we would all be there already. That's another thing. This hasn't happened here, thank goodness, but early in my career I was preaching on love and somebody came up to me and said, when are you gonna get to the meat? I said, what do you mean? Pastor, you don't preach anything but milk. Milk toast sermons. Oh, love this and love that and love that. And I thought to myself as I was listening to this, yeah, 
If you only knew how hard it was to love you right now. <laughs> Maybe not as milk toast as you think. I said, so uh, what does that look like for you? Well, you, you, you we're at the end of time. You should be talking about the prophecies and revelation and how, what, what we're supposed to do in the time of tribulation. I said, it sounds like you already study that. I said, let's just remember together, when it comes to that day, no one will be able to stand. And it isn't going to be what you know that will save you. And that day, it will be who you know that will save you. Love. Love. It's not as easy as it sounds. We're not all as lovable as maybe we wish we, we could be. We're not all as lovable as we think we are. And yet Christ calls us to just that. Not thinking of ourselves as greater than another, but in humble love, serving one another with the grace of Jesus Christ as he did for us. It's pretty powerful. It's pretty important. Well, I won't burn up your whole Saturday here. I know you've got food to eat, places to go, people to talk to, jokes to tell, things to laugh about. I know that this weather doesn't last forever, that Santa Clarita is headed for hot, 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 did I say hot, this summer. And it's actually a really nice day. So I will not keep you forever. But I do want to hit quickly a couple of more ideas. In Acts, the passage that was read to us, they ask, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And I want us to be smarter than this and quit asking this question. We are just like the disciples. It's right in front of us. And we say, Lord, what do you mean? Show us, will you show us the Father? And he has to say to us again, um, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We have messianic expectations. We pray prayers that show that we expect God to behave a certain way in our lives, as if we were in charge of that. Are we really in charge of what God gets to do as an agenda? Anybody think we are? We're not. He's in charge of his agenda. We get to bend his ear. We influence him. He changes his mind according to the scriptures from time to time. He can change his mind about us or you. But there's something really, really cool, really powerful. When we quit asking this question, when are you going to meet our expectations, God? When are you going to be the, behave the way we want you to? That's what 1.6 says. And he said to them, listen, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set. But know this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, Samaria and to the ends of the world. Let's just put that in our own lingo, in our own time. It's not for us to know when he's coming again. It's not for us to know what his agenda is at every minute. It is for us to receive the power he offers and to be his witnesses. That's what that passage says. Interestingly, according to Acts, Jesus says this and immediately is taken up before their eyes. And then I love this. They keep looking. And two men appear. They don't even notice. And the two men say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? It's Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back. Who are you looking for? I can't find the Lord. Where have they laid him? He was in this tomb. Mary, he's not here. He's risen.
Finally, Peter. One of my favorite people in Scripture and in life. Two Peters, two good guys. Actually, I think our Peter here is much less tempestuous than the Peter of Scripture. Much more balanced, mellow, friendly. Hasn't cut anybody's ear off that I know of. (laughs) Peter tells us a little bit about the last day and what we can expect in an era of the Holy Spirit, in an era of Pentecost, in an era of glorification and power. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come to test you. But rejoice as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that when he reveals his glory to you, you may be overjoyed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Now you better be careful with this one. I think sometimes we're looking to invite trouble so that we can say that we fulfill this. If we're to be troubled for the cause of Christ, it better be because we've truly loved one another. It better be because we've blessed the world, not cursed it. It better be because we've been so busy changing social structures by loving those who are unlovable and caring for those who can't care for themselves. It better be for reasons that reflect the gospel of Jesus. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in time. You heard that phrase? That means glorify you. We participate in this divine glory. And then the advice. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a while will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, this text, series of texts I read quickly, you recognize many of them because we've singled them out by line item. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. We have a song about humble yourself. It's actually taken from the Old Testament. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up higher and higher. And he will lift you up. Right? Catchy tune. You know it? How many of you know that? Yeah, we know that. We know the little bit of bitty pieces there. We pulled it all out and memorized it by line. But when you put it all together, it's talking about something greater than any one piece. It's talking about this. Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're actually blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, yes, after you've suffered a while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. And for that, you'll praise him. To him be the glory forever and ever. How do we stand in his glory? How do we stand in the season of the resurrection and ascension and the Holy Spirit? Looks like there are several things. Well, hopefully these passages have guided you and directed you and given you an idea of what we as a people need to continue to be about, what we as a people need to continue to put our energies into, where we need to value things, and how we need to bless the world through the community that we are. 
in Christ. Freely we have received. Freely may we give.